this webinar today um, will be recorded for your information. Um, we will upload it uh, to YouTube and, and other social media um, platforms. We will inform you about that and you will get um, by email a link to that uh, video. Um, all participants today are muted. Um, if you have a question, um, you can write it in the question and uh, answer section. And after the presentation, I will try to answer it. Um, that's me. My name is Heinz Renner. Um, I'm responsible for sales and application support in, in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland for Linzai's company. My email address you can find here below. Please note it. If you have some, some question afterwards, uh, you can send me a mail or if you need any information, just uh, write me an email. Um, okay, let's start with the webinar. The topic today is regulated humidity and water vapor in thermal analysis. The agenda, um, you can see here, we will start with um, the differences between water vapor and humidity. Um, then I will show you um, how relative humidity works um, with some ap application examples, the same with water vapor. And then um, I will tell you um, in, in which instruments uh, humidity and water vapor generators uh, can be um, attached. Um, in, in the field of thermal an analysis, these are TGA, DSC, or simultaneous DSC, TGA, and in our dilatometers, and also in high pressure instruments. So let's start with the difference between water vapor and humidity. Um, on this photograph, you see um, typical um, accessories on the left hand side. It's the relative humidity generator. And on the right hand side, it's, uh, it's showing us the water vapor generator. So these are different accessories. Uh, for different applications. It's uh, important to realize that when we are talking about humidity or water uh, atmospheres, um, there are two kinds of, of ways to apply it. Um, the first one, it's uh, relative humidity. This means uh, the amount of water contained in the atmosphere below the boiling point of water, below 100 degrees Celsius at atmospheric pressure. So um, a, a gas is mixed with, um, with water uh, in, in the gaseous state and then um, conducted into the instrument. On the other uh, side, we have um water vapor um and water vapor above boiling point so above 100 degrees celsius or um for, for higher pressures that the temperature could be also lower but it's uh for for high temperature applications and the water vapor can be used as an atmosphere, as 100% water vapor, or uh, you can mix it also with, with other gases or gas mixtures. Let's start with relative humidity. Um, our humidity generator is working in, uh, in the range from ambient room temperature to 80 degrees Celsius. And the humidity uh, means the amount of water in gram in a certain amount of air in, in kilogram, or instead of air, um, 
other gases can be used as, as carrier gas, um, nitrogen, for example, as an inert gas. Um, relative humidity um, can be explained with um, the graphs, which we can see here. So um, we have a certain capacity of the air um, to store water. And this capacity of air, uh, yeah, that the capacity of the air to store water is increasing with increasing temperatures. So at 10 degrees Celsius, for example, if we have a relative humidity of 100%, and if then, if, if we then would increase the temperature to 20 degrees Celsius, then the relative humidity decreases to 52% because the capacity of uh, the water storage is increasing. And if we would go to 30 degrees Celsius, the relative humidity would go down to 28%. So this means um, the maximum humidity level is dependent on the temperature. Um, everybody knows that in, in summer times, for example, if it is hot outside and uh, in, in many situations, we also have then a, a high humidity because um, increasing temperatures of the air allow more water to be there. The relative humidity is a value um, which is given in, in a percentage. Humidity is gram per kilogram air, and the relative humidity is the percentage, uh, and it gives the actual amount of water um, at, at a given temperature. Um, to run such experiments, um, to, to generate defined relative humidities, um, a dynamic control is required. That means we, we need to uh, control the temperature and the amount of water which we mix um, together with the carrier gas. Um, hang on. It's also important to realize that if, um, if we reach 100% relative humidity, then we are talking about, about the so-called dew point. And if we reach the dew point and would go further down with the temperature, then uh, the water is uh, condensating and it's more or less um, raining in, in the instrument, I would say. And this we want to avoid. Um, it, it's not a big problem if, uh, if, if it happens during an experiment, um, the instruments can be dried um, if, if, they are, if we have some water condensation. But in general, it's, it's good to avoid it and it's uh, good to work below 100% relative humidity. And to find out for your experiment um, which temperatures you could use for a certain relative humidity, uh, a graph like this one here could help to find the low, lowest temperature you can apply. Um, for example, when we look on this green curve here, um, which represents 80% uh, relative humidity, and we um, make an experiment at 25 degree, that's somewhere here. And then if we go, would go down to the temperature, with the temperature, then uh, at this temperature here, at around 20 degrees Celsius, we would reach the 100% relative humidity. And if we would go further down, then we would have water condensation. And with such curves here, um, it's, it's possible to find the dew points for a certain relative humidity. And below zero degrees Celsius, um, 
yeah, usually it makes no sense to make uh, experiments because the percentage uh, of the relative humidity it's, it's very small and it's it's not possible anymore to to store some water under these conditions and that's the reason why usually the measurements are done the starting at around room temperature to 80 degrees celsius um, the setup for your instrument you want to to apply a humidity generator is uh, schematically shown here. So um, the humidity generator looks like this photograph here. And inside um, there is a heater. Uh, there, there is a, a water reservoir. And the water is pumped to the heater uh, evaporator. Um, and then there are several possibilities. Um, at first, you need a, a carrier gas, which is conducted through this mass flow controller. And then in the evaporator, um, the gases water and the gas is mixed and then uh, conducted directly through this heated transfer line into the instrument, or alternatively, a second mass flow controller can be used. And with the second mass flow controller, another gas or the same gas can be used to uh, dilute the, the water vapor, uh, the, or the, the, the water atmosphere or the relative humidity. Here are the specifications. Um, with our water wave, uh, with, with our humidity generator, um, we can, we usually work with um, flow rates of 500 to 15,000 milliliter per minute. Um, that's quite a lot. Usually, we work at the low end of that flow rate. The range which we can adjust is between 2% and 98% relative humidity. The temperature range is mentioned room temperature to 80 degrees Celsius. And the accuracy uh, with which we can um, adjust the humidity is plus minus 1%. Um, we have two measurement modes with the humidity generator. We can make temperature sweeps. That means um, we define the humidity level at a constant level, let's say 50% relative humidity, and then we increase the temperature or we decrease the temperature. But the amount of water stays constant, uh, but the relative humidity will change. It will decrease with increasing temperature and vice versa. The second uh, measurement mode are isothermal conditions. Um, so we go to a constant temperature, to a target temperature, and over this temperature, uh, we vary the relative humidity. Um, experiments at multiple isothermal temperature steps are possible. I will show you um, an application example for that. Um, the first application example was measured with a dilatometer to measure the length change, the uh, expansion or shrinkage. And interesting, uh, in, in these graphs, two bricks um, for the building uh, industry, two bricks, two different bricks have been measured. And the curve on the right-hand side is interesting. It shows the expansion coefficient at different uh, relative humidities. Um, and 
you can see that the expansion coefficient goes down with uh, increasing relative humidity. Another application example was performed with a DSC. Um, sugar was measured um, and sugar shows a glass transition in the DSC and the experiments can be run at uh, different humidities, re relative humidities. And as you can see, the glass transitions, uh, glass transition temperatures decrease um, quite strongly with increasing uh, humidity. Um, and that's quite useful for the food industry to have such results. That's important um, to see if the product is, is still good or to find out uh, the storage temperatures, um, usually for, for sugar products and, and starch and uh, products like that, the storage temperature um, or that the glass transition should always be above the storage temperature. If it is below, then um, the material can undergo some transitions you, you don't want to have. And, then the food is not good anymore. Um, another uh, experiment is shown here. It's uh, a stepwise increase of the humidity at constant temperatures. And a polymer was measured here. And uh, it's, it's an isothermal experiment. So we see here an increase in temperature up to that level here. And then uh, we, we can see at 20 degrees, an uptake of water at 40 degree, 60, 80, and 85. And interesting here are also that the time dependent uptake of water from these studies um, kinetic uh, parameters can be calculated. Another example um, is uh, the sorption of, of water on a, on a zeolite. Um, what was done here? Um, at first, the, the red curve shows the temperature profile. The sample was heated up. And by that, the water which was adsorbed is desorbing at that temperature. Then the temperature was lowered again to that level here. And then at this temperature level, uh, the isothermal sorption of water was investigated at different uh, par partial pressures of the water vapor. So we have here three different pressures. And then after this isothermal temperature, is, uh, adsorption was finished. The temperature was increased again to desorb the water. And then a decrease of temperature to a different temperature level to make uh, or to, to record the isotherm at a higher temperature and the same for a third temperature. And then um, we see that the raw data is looking like that here. Um, when the temperature is increased, we see a desorption of water. The green curve, that's um, the TGA curve, it goes down due to the mass loss of uh, water. And then we go down again with the temperature to that level here. And then we see the adsorbing of water at that temperature level. And the blue curve is the DSC curve um, because the measurement was done in a simultaneous TG DSC. And from the peak here, we can calculate the sorption heat during sorption of water on the zero light, heat is evolving. And then we heat up again, 
cool down to a higher temperature level and make again this adsorption. The adsorption here then starting from that higher uh, temperature level is lower. The mass uptake is 14% here. It was 15.6 at the lower temperature. And if we do that on a third temperature, then we can uh, calculate our results and we can see or we get at the end um, adsorption isotherms at different temperatures and at uh, adsorption isotherms are the mass uptake of the zeolite versus uh, the pressure, the pressure of, of this humidity of this water. And then you, you get these isotherms and at different temperatures with um, yeah, decreasing temperature, you can see that at um, this 34 degree, you have a higher uptake than compared to the 76 degree curve. Similar curves you get when you plot the heat absorption as a function of the pressure, you can see the higher the pressure, then with increasing pressure, of course, the sorption heats go up and all depends on, on the isothermal temperature. And from these data, kinetic uh, data, data can be uh, generated. Um, curves like this and um, the curves show that the sorption speed depends strongly on, on the, the temperatures. Then in the next chapter, we will have a look on a water vapor. Um, the water vapor unit looks like illustrated here in that photograph. Um, we have a water reservoir here and from that water the reservoir, we, we are using a pump uh, to, to pump the, the water into the evaporator here. And then we, we see that later on in the graph, we can um, pump 100% water vapor into the instrument or mix it with gases. And um, when we look on the phase diagram, then of course at ambient uh, temperature, if we work or if we work at ambient pressure, we need to have minimum 100 degrees Celsius. We are working in the gaseous state here in that level or in that um, part of the phase diagram. So we need to have a certain temperature or if we increase the pressure, then we can uh, go to other temperatures to do our then we, we need even higher temperatures um, to, to get water vapor. Um, often, if uh, water vapor is used, also evolved gas analysis like um, uh, mass spectrometers or other devices are used. We will see later in, in an application why that's the case. Here is um, a schematical drawing which shows the water reservoir here, the pump which pumps the water into the evaporator. And then we have here a heated transfer line into the instrument. It's shown here, that's the black line here. And then um, it's also possible to use mass flow controllers here to mix uh, the water vapor with one gas or more in the evaporator. There are small metallic spheres which mix uh, the water vapor with the gas. Um, and then um, the atmospheres can react with your sample and the evolved gases can be analyzed with mass spectrometer, for example. The flow rates we are using are smaller compared to the relative humidity generator. We are working 
between 10 to 500 milliliter per minute. Uh, and the water concentration, which we can use, it can be up to 100 and down to 1%. Usually, uh, the temperature range is between 100 and 1,600 degrees Celsius. And the accuracy uh, is plus minus 1% uh, for the water vapor concentration. A typical example is shown here. It was generated with our high pressure STA. And it shows um, the measurement curve of a coal sample. So the coal was heated up uh, in at first in nitrogen, in pure nitrogen atmosphere at a pressure of 50 bar. And then you see here the red curve, which represents the mass loss. Some volatiles uh, evaporate here. And then if that uh, mass loss is finished, a water vapor was guided into the instrument. And as soon as uh, this happens, the coal reacts with the water vapor and the coal burns off. This is called gasification. Uh, and it reacts. The coal here is the equation. Coal is carbon. It reacts with the water. And hydrogen and carbon monoxide is formed under that pressure of 50 bar. And to identify these um, form gases, the, the mass uh, spectrometer is, is very useful. Under different conditions, um, if you use a different pressure or different temperature, or if you mix um, the, the water vapor with CO, CO2, or other gases, then different uh, reaction gases can be, or uh, form gases can build. Um, so that, that was um, some ex examples in the field of water vapor and relative humidity. Um, now I will show you for which instruments which we have in our product range, a humidity generator or uh, a water vapor generator can be attached. We start with the classical thermal analysis instrument, uh, ESCs, TGAs, uh, and the most common instrument uh, where we use water vapor or relative humidity is our STA PT1600. Uh, it's a universal instrument which can work up to high temp temperatures. Um, we have different balances with ultra high resolution or balances for high sample weights up to 50 gram. Um, when uh, doing TG DSC experiments, we have two sensors. The standard sensor looks like that here. A reference sample or a, a, an empty reference is measured against the, the sample um, in a classical heat flux setup. Alternatively, um, we have a three-dimensional Calve DSC sensor, which is uh, more sensitive. Um, the, the thermocouples, which measure the temperature difference between uh, the sample and the reference, um, is winded around the crucibles. And we are using a thermopile with multiple thermocouples. So that means that the heat flow is not only measured at the bottom of the crucibles, but also uh, around the walls of the crucibles. So this leads to much higher sensitivities. For TGTTA uh, measurements, we use crucibles like that. They are uh, a little bit bigger compared to the DSC crucibles. 
for pure TGA measurements, we can use very big uh, crucibles up to 12 millimeters um, for, for inhomogeneous samples, for example, or we can use mesh uh, crucibles, wheels, um, which enable a, a good reaction of, of the gas or water vapor uh, with the sample. We can use hang down samples if you have sheet samples. So we have a broad variety of, of different crucibles which can be used. The temperature range is uh, plotted here. We have a broad variety of furnaces. Uh, on one uh, instrument, more than one furnace can, can be applied up to three furnaces uh, to reach uh, a very broad temperature range uh, from minus 150 to 2,400. Um, we have also some customized solutions, some uh, inductive or infrared heaters, which also can be applied. Um, with these uh, heaters, very high heating rates, uh, a couple of thousand Kelvin per second can be reached. Um, inductive heating is often applied in uh, if, if you have metals or alloys. Then um, the water vapors uh, generator or the humidity generators can also be attached to our pushrod dilatometers. We have horizontal ones and vertical ones. Um, the horizontal uh, setup, it's um, easy and robust. It's uh, perfect for uh, temperatures up to 1600 degree Celsius. Um, the sample handling, it's, it's easy and uh, horizontal dilatometers are lower in price compared to vertical ones. The vertical setup has the advantage of zero friction. Um, in the horizontal dilatometer, the sample is placed in, the, in a half open tube. And during the measurement, it can work against uh, the sample holder. And um, for some experiments for sintering processes, that is um, disturbing the results. And that's the reason why for um, friction sensitive applications, the vertical setup um, is uh, much better. For the vertical uh, dilatometers, multiple furnaces can be attached, up to three of them um, to increase the temperature range or to increase the sample throughput for quality control, for example. And uh, also a small advantage or for some people, a big advantage is the smaller lab space uh, of the vertical setup. Um, for the horizontal and the vertical setup, we have single and double dilatometers with one or two sample holder. Um, for the vertical setup, we can also apply four sample holder. Um, then we are talking about the quattro dilatometer with four sample holders. So four samples at the same time can be measured or three samples against a reference. The furnace program is illustrated here. It's more or less the same compared to the STAs. Um, regarding the dilatometers, in addition to the pushrod dilatometers, we also have optical dilatometers. Um, they are more known as heating microscopes. Um, the components of the heating microscopes are uh, here. They are equipped with a camera, with um, the filter the furnace, the, the sample is inside the furnace and here is a light source shining into the furnace through um, optical ports on that side and on this side. And then if the light shines on the sample, which is placed here, then 
we see the shadow image of the sample and record it with a high resolution camera. And also the optical dilatometers, um, they are also vacuum tight down to 10 to minus five millibar. They can be run in, in any atmosphere, in humidity, in, in water vapor, and in, in mixed gas atmospheres. Um, a comparison of the push rod and the optical dilatometer is here. Um, the resolution of the push rod dilatometer is better. It's uh, in nominal, it's below one nanometer, but in real life, you can achieve below 10 nanometer. For the optical dilatometer, it's one micrometer. The temperature range can be, is, is broader with the push rod dilatometers. Um, the sample dimensions are more or less the same. The big advantage of the optical dilatometers is that they are absolutely forceless. There is no force load during the experiment. And another ad, uh, advantage is that um, phase transitions uh, can be completely run through. In a push rod dilatometer, that's not possible. Only solid samples can be measured. If a phase transition or softening point is reached, then um, the, the experiment is terminated if um, the shrinkage is uh, above a certain level. That's not the situation in an optical dilatometer. When the sample is melting, um, then uh, a half sphere is formed for metals, for example. Um, and then the contact angle can be calculated. And from the contact angle, angle um, the surface tension and viscosity. And this can be done on, on different uh, substrates. And interesting studies can be made with the optical dilatometer. Um, here is an example of the shadow images, how they look like at the beginning. Then we come, we, we reach the melting area and a half sphere is formed. Um, here are some data regarding um, the temperature range and resolution. We skip that. Um, when the CTE, the coefficient of thermal expansion, needs to be done in an optical dilatometer. Uh, we have to place a sample and a reference in, into the instrument. And then we measure the expansion of the sample and compare it with the reference, the reference uh, CTE at different temperatures we know. And then from the comparison, we get the CTE also in an optical dilatometer. Um, at um, the end of that presentation, um, I will show you our high pressure instruments. Um, we, we can use high pressure in many of our instruments. Uh, in, for example, in, in our DSC instruments, in the dilatometers, in the thermography matrix analyzers, or in the simultaneous TG DSC instruments. And we usually work with our instruments up to 150 bar and up to 1600 uh, degrees Celsius. So 150 bar and at the same time, 1,600 degrees Celsius uh, can be reached. Uh, an overview sheet you can find here of the pressure ranges and the temperature ranges of the individual equipments. Um, our newest one is um, the TGA STA HP3. Um, it allows pressures up to 150 bar and temperatures up to 1200 uh, degrees Celsius. It can be equipped with a humidity generator and a water vapor generator. And um, 
the STA or TGA HP3. It's a small instrument. It's a tabletop instrument, and it uh, fits in practically all laboratories. When we look back, the STA HP1 or 2, for example, which are illustrated here, are very big instruments. And in many situations, you need a separate room for them. Um, that's not the situation with our new STA HP3. A typical setup is illustrated here. Uh, on the left hand side, mass flow controllers. Uh, it can be extended. Uh, if, if in this situation, three mass flow controllers are built here, but it can be extended to, to more. On the right hand side is the water vapor generator. Here is the evaporator, and there is um, pure water vapor can be conducted in, or it can be mixed with the mass flow controllers here. So that's it um, for today. Thank you for your attention. Um, as I said at the beginning, you will get an email with, uh, with a link when we have uploaded this presentation. Um, you can also have a look here on our website, linsize.com. You find much more information about uh, our individual instruments. And you find, find you will find their information about upcoming webinars or exhibitions where we uh, show our instruments. 